today I flew school. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm the Education Director at the Columbia SLU Watershed Council. And today on SLU School, I'm going to be talking about the native and invasive plants that we have here at Whitaker Ponds. Um, there's going to be a lot of segments that I call Boo in the SLU. So when I talk about plants that are important in our land by the water, the riparian zone. Um, I think about three classifications, herbs, shrubs, and trees. And herbs are little plants um, that like grow flowers. They don't have wood in them. Shrubs are like this. They're like bushes. They don't have a central trunk, but they have a bunch of woody stems and they grow to be like 12 feet tall or less and then last of all the third kind of plants are trees and most people in this world know what a tree is it's just um a, it's a plant that's gonna, gonna grow really tall and it's got a central trunk made of wood so we've got a lot of native trees here at Whitaker Ponds um, but we also have some trees that aren't from around here we have a lot of shrubs that are from here that are native, and this is one of them. This is red flowering currant, and this is the uh, this is one of the first shrubs that leafs out in the spring. So it's going to have a bunch of baby leaves coming out in like February and March, and then it also makes these beautiful bright pink flowers, and these are really important for pollinators. Um, and they also make berries. And here we are in November, and this is one tiny little uh, current left on this bush, but these are gonna be food for birds um, and small mammals. I'm gonna throw it on the ground there so somebody can eat it. Right behind this red flowering current is my first boo in the slough. <laughs> Up here there's this vine and it's got these white like poofy things on it this is a plant called traveler's joy and traveler's joy is a vine that grows everywhere and it gets out of control when we want to tackle traveler's vine I like just ripping it out in the sleeve. This has like a hexagon shaped vine and it's got these compound leaves that look like this. So um, it's got this section, this section, this section, this section. And then um, you can see it like vines up really tall and it's got those seeds that are in those uh, flowers up at the top. They spread and it's like Okay, another one that we've got next to us is a classic. It is Himalayan blackberry. Himalayan blackberry is, I think, the most economically expensive invasive plant in the state of Oregon. Um, and Himalayan blackberry is really effective at creating um, new roots wherever it goes. You probably don't want to do this at home unless you have some really nice gloves because Himalayan blackberry has lots of thorns on it. I can't pull it out of the ground because its roots are really strong. Um, but this is another plant that vines and takes over. I'm here with another native shrub. This is red osier dogwood. Red osier dogwood is a shrub. You can tell it grows less than 12 feet, but it can grow to be a pretty uh, strong shrub. Um, 
This guy is important. It has uh, flowers for pollinators and those flowers are gonna turn into little berries. This shrub loves growing around here because it loves water. You can identify it in the winter by its red stem with little white dots. This is a plant you can do live staking with and if you ever want to know about live staking, we can talk about it later. Okay, um, in the herb department, we do have some invasive herbs here at Whitaker Ponds. Um, this one is one that you especially don't want to mess around with. It is called poison hemlock. Poison hemlock. Van um, has these like red stalks and they kind of remind people of like parsley or celery, but you super don't want to eat this. Um, the way somebody gave me a tip one time that it looks like kind of look like blood spatters and that's the way to make sure that you're like, I really don't want to eat that plant. Um, poison hemlock like spreads all over the place and it doesn't really help anybody. Um, right next door we've got another herb and this one is called teasel and teasel grows in this like flat rosette on the ground um, but later as it gets older it grows up and it has this like massive spike on top um, and for some reason I don't know why but like I can't find one directly around me but I know we'll find one later if I try to get rid of this plant, I would want to have a shovel because it's got little spikes all over it and I'm not wearing gloves. Um, it has this one massive tap root that goes down and in this soil, it's just hard to get rid of. So anyway, teasel and poison hemlock. by the water, the riparian zone of the Columbia Slough. The Columbia Slough is that small, slow, skinny, shallow body of water that runs parallel to the Columbia River over a course of 18 miles. We're here pretty much in the middle of it at Whitaker Ponds. Um, and this is a place where it's really uh, clear to see like how all these herbs, shrubs, and trees have an effect on the health of the water. So um, over here, uh, if we pan to the right, uh, we can see um, the soil is being held in place by the roots of this really tall cottonwood tree. And that cottonwood tree is covered on the trunk by, guess what, another invasive plant. That invasive plant is English ivy. And English ivy is a plant that loves growing on trees. And it doesn't take anything out of the tree. Some people think that it like leeches nutrients out of the tree um, but in fact it's just like climbing on it and it ends up growing these vines that are super thick and it'll choke that tree out so it's like it essentially gets strangled. Um, this cottonwood tree is super important for lots of animals around here including um, beavers and also tons of birds that use it for perching and roosting. Um, but for the water quality, it's also super important because in the summer, those leaves are the only thing protecting this water from the heat of the sun. Um, the Columbia Slough is a place that um, used to be, before settlers showed up, um, surrounded by lots of different kinds of native plants. And the water was, you know, able to be protected by all those plants. Um, but today with all the development around here and the removal of so many native plants, 
and canopy, it's making it a lot harder for that water to stay healthy. So you're gonna see um, an increased risk of warm water and water that's more turbid, which just means it's kind of muddy. Um, that makes it a lot harder for animals to have a good time living here. So uh, fish that need cold water, like salmon, uh, lower down in the slough, they really need cold water. If we don't have native trees, like the cottonwood, protecting that water, um, it's gonna mean lower health for a lot of animals that need this water to survive. Another reason that cottonwood trees and other native trees are important to have is because beavers really depend on those native trees um, for their food and also so they can build their shelter in the form of dams. Um, cottonwood trees around here, um, they're really good at growing fast, but they're also quickly taken down. Um, by the beaver population here. Whitaker Ponds is like a big habitat chunk that is a fraction of what the entire Columbia Slough watershed used to be. Um, so when we talk about habitats, um, it's a place where an animal can get food, water, shelter, air, and space. And beaver's habitat used to be this whole area, but it is really shrunken into tiny pockets recently um, and so these native trees are like super important to keep around so that you know we can at least have a balance for the beavers that still are using this habitat. Here we have two native plants, one tree, one shrub. Their leaves look pretty similar. Um, this is the big leaf maple. The big leaf maple is a native maple. Um, it's got five points, M-A-P-L-E. Um, and this tree is right back here. It's definitely not all the way grown up. It has a lot of life yet to live inside of it, but um, this is another tree that's really good at creating shade. Um, this is also a photosynthesis factory. Um, big leaf maples, I think are capable of making like over two and a half tons of sugar per year in the form of glucose. Um, so they're really good at taking energy from the sun and turning it into sugar. Um, right over here though, we have a leaf that looks kind of similar. Um, this is a shrub and it's called thimbleberry. Thimbleberry is a cousin of blackberries and raspberries. Um, and it has one, two, three, four, five points as well. How do you tell the difference between a big leaf maple and a thimbleberry? A good way to tell is by feeling the texture of the leaf. Um, Thimbleberry has a reputation for being the softest plant in the forest, um, so that people sometimes call it nature's toilet paper. Um, and you can totally eat the berries when they come out in like May and June. Um, they're red and velvety and they're great. So yeah, thimbleberry, maple. You may remember me talking about how the trees at Whitaker Ponds can get chewed down really easily by beavers because there isn't a whole lot of like space or food to share among many beavers. Um, so to make sure that there are still trees around to provide shade, um, there are these beaver cages that are put around a bunch of the trees here. 
Um, we put these in every year and they work pretty well, but sometimes the beavers still figure out how to get around them. This tree is actually one that I'm a little surprised is caged. This is um, a This is an evergreen tree, um, and I think it's a Douglas fir. This Douglas fir is our state tree, um, but it's not really a wetland tree. Um, this tree was probably planted in the last 20 years. Um, so if we cut like a cross section of this tree, uh, we might find like 20 rings inside of it. Um, when this tree gets older, it's gonna have really big, thick, chunky bark. Um, but it's kind of here still in its growing up phase. And um, fir trees have bark that has these little blisters in it, and they remind me a lot of zits. Woo! Um, these fir trees have lots of little blisters with sap inside of them. Why? I don't know. Um, but if you ever want to like have fun in the forest and like, um, smell some nice sap, this is a great way to do it. One more reason why trees are important is that even um, after trees aren't alive anymore, they're still really important for a bunch of different animals that live in this habitat. Um, so this is a cottonwood tree that no longer has leaves on it. It's got a bunch of fungus coming out the side of the trunk when you look up so you know it's not alive anymore. Um, but this is gonna be a really important place for lots of animals that are looking for dead bugs. And also, uh, just lots of birds that like to perch. Um, I've definitely walked around this pond and seen bald eagles hanging out on the branches of this dead tree, which we call a snag. Um, so, again, um, it's cool when plants are alive, especially native plants, but it's also cool because after they die, they still keep being a part of this place in important ways. So I've been talking a lot about invasive species that are plants that are a big boo in the slough, uh, but there is a, an amphibian, had to think for a second, um, called the bullfrog that is also invasive and it causes uh, some pretty serious problems for a couple of our native species. Uh, one species is the western painted turtle. Um, that species hangs out a lot here at Whitaker Ponds. Um, and then there's another one called the Pacific Chorus Frog or the Pacific Tree Frog. And that is a native frog from around here. It's usually like kind of little, has a black stripe on its eye and it loves singing um, to attract mates. But uh, the invasive species, the bullfrog, is bigger and it loves to eat eggs and tadpoles. So uh, bullfrogs are really good at hurting uh, the young of the western painted turtle and they're really good at hurting the young of the Pacific chorus frog. Um, so if you see a bullfrog in Oregon, you aren't supposed to let it live. You're supposed to totally kill it. Um, I've never killed a bullfrog because I'm a baby, um, but just so you know, that's how serious it is. Um, so just say no to bullfrogs. Um, I'm in an area that is right next to a baseball field. It used to just be grass and you'd have to mow the grass and the grass wasn't really helping like very many things survive in this habitat. Um, so over the last few years, Portland Parks has been working on transforming this uh, into a place full of native plants. Uh, we, you know, we planted some and they didn't make it, uh, but we planted some and they did make it. An example is right over here. This is called Cascara. Cascara is, well, let's check it out. Is it a shrub or a tree? Does it have a central trunk or not? I 
think it might just be one of those tricky shrubs that grows really big. Um, yeah, we've got uh, a baby cottonwood over here and we've got little oak trees. Oak trees are cool and they are gonna, you know, grow more slowly than some of the other trees around here. Cottonwood grows really fast. Alder grows really fast. Um, but oak is more of a slow grower and so it's cool to know that this tree has like gotten established and it's hopefully going to be able to like make its home here as the years go on. Um, let's see. I don't know. I just love this area and if you were coming to do a planting here at Whitaker Ponds this year, this is probably where you would be putting stuff in. Um, but yeah, lots of shrubs, lots of little trees coming in here um, and filling in and creating habitat. I like to call this park Whitaker Ponds. Most people in Portland call this place Whitaker Ponds, but it didn't always have that name. It's called Whitaker Ponds because in the 1840s, a white settler named Andrew Whitaker uh, was given this land for free by the U.S. government as part of the Donation Land Act. But before that, forever, this was Chinook land and this was the village of near Chokiku. Uh, behind me is the Native American Youth and Family Center. And uh, they picked the building here that, at a place that used to be Whitaker Middle School because it was on uh, the land that was so important to the Chinook people since time immemorial. Um, today they're doing amazing work putting in the plants that they want to be here. Um, this land has been used as a farm and as a baseball field and now they're deciding to put in uh, more plants that are good for uh, their community. Um, this is a place though that also intersects with another property line and you can see what happens when invasive plants don't have people taking care of them. This is a giant cascade of Himalayan blackberry that has taken over this property. This property line here, can you see the difference between people who are caring for it and people who aren't? This side and then this side. Um, this is a better example of hazelnut. Uh, this is, again, that shrub that makes you think it's a tree, but it's got a bunch of uh, woody stems instead of a central trunk. Um, this competes with thimbleberry for being the softest leaf around, um, but a lot of people still think it's thimbleberry that's the softest. Um, we are getting into an area that beavers love to hang out in. Um, so we've got a bunch of trees that we have put cages on, like this guy right here. Um, but we have a bunch of trees that also didn't make it and fell down. Um, so we're going to go check out what happened to all those trees that fell on the ground. All right, we are in Beaver Town. Um, we've also got some invasive species here as well. Um, on the side of this tree, we've got English ivy, <laughs> up this living cottonwood tree. Um, so we're probably gonna have to pull that English ivy away. Um, it's one of those ones you just gotta rip out and that's how we take care of it. As you can see, this is a place where trees are really important food for beavers. We've got a bunch of down sticks in here which are decomposing and putting nutrients back into the soil, um, which is really important for this area. <sighs> More English ivy. <laughs> Yeah, so those are those roots. Um, one of the things about uh, invasive plants that is like 
Uh, one of the secret bummers people don't always think about is that invasive plants come in and they take over a place. Um, their roots are usually not as effective at holding soil in place as native plants are. So if all the trees and all the shrubs that uh, belong in this place ended up getting taken over by English ivy and Himalayan blackberry, their root structures would not be as good at holding the soil in place, which means when we have a giant rainstorm, like the one that's probably coming right now, the soil, it's easier for it to end up in the water where it doesn't belong, and that is called erosion. So we're at a place that the Bureau of Environmental Services put in to Whitaker Ponds a while ago. We're talking like, probably in the last two decades. Um, and there's these pipes down here, and then there's a bunch of water. Um, these pipes take storm water, which is rainwater that washes off the streets, and it comes down here. Um, if I took a cup of that water, it would probably be pretty dirty. Um, because the things that come off the streets, of course there's dirt, but there's also like gas and oil, there's uh, brake dust, and there's just like a lot of gross stuff that comes out in the stormwater. It's not good for wildlife to have that pollution um, in their bodies. And so this is a place that uh, BES constructed to help reduce that pollution from the stormwater. So one of the main ways they do that is by using plants. Um, you may have seen uh, these things in the sidewalks out in the city called bioswales, which are just kind of like big holes full of plants where water from the street goes in. Um, and these plants are really good at removing pollution from the sediment and also from the water. Um, one of those plants right down here is called a sedge. Um, and you might just call it grass, but there's a little rule that's like sedges have edges, rushes are round, um, and then grass is like, you know, this is grass. Grass is like blades. Um, so anyway, slough sedge um, is hanging out all through here. Uh, these alder trees are also helping with their root, and there's a giant willow back there that's also helping. And these plants together are helping to clean out the water, so by the time it makes it to the pond, that water is going to be a lot more uh, survivable for uh, the wildlife that need this water. So I'm standing here next to yet another cottonwood snag. Um, this is a tree that used to be alive, and mm, I think I know how it died. This is um, a vine from English ivy. So before, when I was showing you that like those English ivy uh, roots are not good at holding on to soil, um, these are like these little grabbies that it uses to vine onto trees and climb all the way up. Uh, this vine climbed all the way to the top of the tree. They're really good at going up to like a hundred feet up. And by the way, I love playing this game, true or false, ivy grows flowers which become berries. Until a couple years ago, I would have said false, but it turns out that English ivy does grow flowers which turn into berries, which birds love to eat, and then they poop out the seeds and that ivy just grows so many places. Um, so yeah, we're here in the west part of West Whitaker Pond, and this is a place where uh, a bunch of different invasive plants love growing for whatever reason. And one of those invasive plants is this other vine called Morning Glory. Morning Glory has these tiny little vines that wind around all the different shrubs that grow around here. Um, and they're very prolific and they're very difficult to get rid of. Um, if anybody is researching morning glory and they have a good way to get rid of it, um, feel free to let me know because it is just everywhere.
Okay, I'm over here by West Pond, right next to the water. Um, and I came here because there's a plant that loves to grow around here um, called nightshade. And nightshade is another one of those plants that you definitely don't want to eat. Um, I can identify this plant because it's got like these long vines. They're kind of like long heart-shaped leaves. The stem has this like grayish greenish color to it. Um, and then in the fall and the summer, they have these like big juicy red berries that come out. <sighs> they get everywhere. Um, so I just pulled this nightshade out of the ground and this is what the roots look like. Again, they don't look like they're doing a great job at holding onto the soil. They're just like really long and good at spreading out. I'm gonna lay this here so it doesn't get back on the ground and like reroot. Um, another plant around here that we've actually done a really good job at controlling is yellow flag iris. <laughs> flag iris is beautiful. It's a bulb plant um, that spreads really easily. It's just one of those plants that's like super prolific. It makes it so other plants that are good at holding onto the soil and making shade um, and creating food for the animals that live here um, can't grow here. So uh, I know that Portland Parks has been doing work with like controlled spraying around these ponds for the last couple years to restrict the growth of yellow flag iris so other plants have a better chance of making it here. I think that's about it for native and invasive plants of the Columbia Slough. Thanks for joining me and I hope one day after the pandemic is over and the construction on Northeast 47th is over, you can come out here and check out all these plants for yourself. <laughs>